First, I'd like to say good evening. The second thing I'd like to say is obviously we're not going to do this in one lecture. Third, I'm going to do something which I typically don't do, and that is I want to show tonight and one other time I'm going to show a video because there's just no way to replicate what's on this video, and I think it would just tremendously behoove you to see this. And the next thing I wanted to say was that the schedule is a little different than usual. It's this Thursday, next Thursday, and then the week of Thanksgiving, it is, I believe, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, if I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty sure it's the Wednesday, the 26th. And for the rest of the schedule, hopefully we'll have that printed. It is online so that you'll know what we're, what's going on under St. Spiridon, if you look in the bulletins, so that you can follow along. I'm not going to pretend to even try to do an exhaustive uh, lecture on evolution, but I certainly am going to do my best to give you information. Honestly, my goal is first and foremost to present to you our church's view, some of the scientific view, most importantly to open our minds because throughout the system of the United States what is taught to be sure is evolution. It is not taught as a theory. It is taught as the way the world came into being. If you read, and you'll see some of this on, one, on this video I believe that I'm going to show you, if you if you see that volumes of information that disprove the theory have been presented to the court system, but the ACLU, which has a profound amount of funds, is able to tie technically and in legalese, not to try the case, but just to prevent the case from really being evaluated for its merits, for its worth in the court system. Therefore, the theory itself has never really been tried in the court system. The only thing that has been discussed is, and, and confused, and you're going to hear some of this in one of my statements, is that they have been able to construct an argument such that anything you say about the existence of a, creation, a creator becomes immediately a religious question and therefore discounts any and all scientific information after that. I dare say, I dare say that if the fathers of this country were still alive, first of all, they would never get elected. They would be so prejudicially treated because all they did was quote the scriptures, Old and New Testament, and I might say also even in the Greek. But in addition to that, it, it just challenges the, the curiosity of the mind to understand how the preamble to the Constitution, the Constitution and so many other documents, and even the Pledge of Allegiance, which was changed, I remember, I think I was in first grade, to include under God. These things are stated throughout, and supposedly, and it says still thus far, in God we trust on our money. The new quarters have in God we trust, not where you could read it, only if you had an electron microscope and you can read the ridge around that's where we put in God we trust. The next place I suspect will be just off. And I know it is funny, and, it's, you know, and I make it to be funny, but it's sad. But nonetheless, it should be clear that this is, these are the kinds of things that are going on. And there's one clear, present danger and motivation to remove God from the equation of life, period. I offer to you the fact that one of the most difficult things that socialism faced was the existence of a God, especially during the Marxist times and the Stalin times and what have you. And during the Nazi times, do you know that the theory of evolution was used to deprogram people who believed in Nazism and Marxism and what have you, but had the difficulty that they believed in God because they believed there was a creator God. And that they would spend as much as two years talking to them about Darwinism just to get out of their minds the fact that God exists because of the creation. And as a result of that, they were successful in deprogramming, if you will, forgive me for the term, maybe it's not the best one, but removing or at least raising a sufficient amount of doubts 
in the minds of those people who were converting to their way of thought, starting with and spending much time on Darwinism, the removal of God from the world. To be sure, true evolution is based absolutely on atheism, the removal of God. And anyone who thinks differently is just trying to put mustard and ketchup on something that is not a hot dog. Okay? Or a hamburger, whatever you like. Enjoy them tonight. Lent starts Monday. I mean Saturday, excuse me. A pleasant thought. The National Academy of Sciences, which is one of, the, one of the groups and organizations that has worked so hard to establish evolution and to make sure that the court system would not try the theory itself, claims to represent the most prestigious scientists in the nation. I'd like to repeat a story that some of you have heard from me before but it is worth noting at this point. Albert Einstein, in 1905, purported the theory of relativity, the first part of the theory. He was sitting in a patent office thinking that everything that ever could be created or invented had been invented in 1905. He was just a, a clerk, an officer there. Well, when he presented his theory, the fact is, of course, that he completely expanded and opened the boundaries to almost making them boundaryless in the fields of science throughout the strata of various science fields. I don't want to spend time on that. But in 1905, he was an atheist. And he, in order to make sure that he would ensure that his theory would, in essence, be able to establish some way to understand the world coming into being. Without a God, he established, we know when you have mathematical equations, you have to make sometimes an assumption as you, as you prepare to offer solutions to these equations. You assume a certain form of a solution, and then you put it into the equation, and you modify it to see if you can solve the equations. Einstein did that. Do you know what the assumption was that he made? He assumed that the world did not begin at any one point. That the world began by matter and antimatter existing throughout the so-called universe. There was no one point of origin. Now, why is that so important? Because it is the antithesis to what both the scriptures present and later on what scientific and mathematical evidence presents as the way the world came into being. Let's look at that for a second. In 1930, there was another young man, German, von Steuben, mathematician. He was so taken by the equations of uh, relativity that Einstein had purported, except that he did not accept his solution. Von Steuben was a God-believing man. He said, let me look at the solution. If truly everything began at a point, then... Somewhere, there should be a mathematical failure in the solution of Albert Einstein to his equations. Do you know what he found? He found that Albert Einstein, in one of his terms, had divided by zero. Those of you who know anything about math know that you cannot divide by zero except to get the answer infinity or basically undefined. When he found this, he knew, of course, that he was talking about the stature of an Albert Einstein who had basically rocketed science into a whole nother, not chapter, a whole nother volume of existence. So he knew that he couldn't just go out and say, well, you know what, listen, uh, big guy, like your equations, but you divided by zero. So he said, let me see A if I can come up with a solution. So he did. How? postulating that everything began at a point. Now he said, that's not going to be sufficient. So let me see if I can get some empirical proof to the fact that everything began at a point. So he goes to Las Vegas, Nevada, not for the games, but where the telescope is, otherwise known as lost wages. <laughs> Thank God I've never been there, although there's a nice Orthodox church there. I've seen it online. 
were no gambling there, I mean, at the church. Yeah. And there was then a 60-inch telescope, which was pretty powerful in those days. He began to take pictures of the stars, and he noted something. Some of the stars had a red tail. Some of them had a blue tail. Now, what that means to a scientist is that there is a difference in wavelength. The red ones have a longer wavelength and move shorter. The blue tail has a shorter wavelength and moves faster. He said to himself, what is this that I'm seeing? And he began to uncover that there were certain bodies as if they were moving slower than his reference frame or moving towards his reference frame so that the speeds would subtract. And on the other hand, there were others that were moving at a very fast rate way out into space. And what did he recognize? He recognized that now he could demonstrate empirically that everything seemed to be spherically, as it were, exploding the entire universe from what seemed to be a point of origin. When he presented both the mathematical solution, both the fallacy in Einstein's solutions, and then the empirical proof, the world of physics stopped and took note of what von Steuben had to say. Einstein, for two months, went into his room and became basically uh, a person who didn't want to see anyone. People thought that it was his ego that was insulted. It wasn't his ego. You know what Einstein realized? Einstein realized the famous statement that he made when he went to Nevada and saw for himself what von Steuben had seen. Some super engineer had to make and design this world. Some super engineer had to make and design this world. This world, what he says later on, did not come into existence. And when he said in 1948 to Professor Sacalaridis at Yale University, and I believe it was his final interview, he said, God doesn't play dice with the world, with the universe. There's order in the universe. And God is the one who conducts and contains that order. I submit to you tonight that if Albert Einstein were to be alive today, he would be the greatest refuter of the Big Bang Theory and the greatest refuter of the theory of evolution based strictly on his own understanding, his own perceptions, his own solutions, his own findings, empirical findings via von Steuben as to the kinds of things that had been, that exist. One person who's not part of the National Academy of Sciences, to be sure, is Albert Einstein. And I don't think that there's anybody who would ever refute that he has to be one of the greatest scientists. There are many who have ever existed. If you ever read his life, you'll see how they used to pay the waiters after he ate something to collect his napkins because he would sit there and doodle, but what he was doodling was about